Hello friends, I'm Ashish Tabari, founder and CEO of Axamize. To our new listeners, welcome. And to our old ones, welcome back. So today's podcast is going to be an interesting one. I've got quite a few things playing up in my mind right now. So I've got constraints playing up in my mind from last week's uh, podcast. I've got processors on my mind and I've got architectural modeling on my mind and I've got, of course, formal verification. So what I would like to be able to do today is to make a connect between all of these. And I think the best way to do this is to provide you a story about some of the work that we've been doing on RISC-5 formal verification. So as a lot of you know, um, open source RISC-5 has changed everything and lots and lots of new companies are developing RISC-5 processors. And this newfound freedom is truly intoxicating. Um, as some of you may know, we are members of Open Hardware Group. And in that context, we have been involved in trying to explore what Axiomize can do um, for the Open Hardware Group uh, activities. And one of the things that we have been trying to do is to see if we can contribute towards the verification of some of the processors in the Open Hardware Group using our automated uh, ISO formal proof kit. What I want to talk about is some of the verification challenge that we have actually seen in the context of RISC-5 verification. So what we're seeing is that a lot of different designs are coming up. Um, some of them actually work better than the other. But by and large, the verification work is not that well done. Um, so, you know, ver verification and validation consumes nearly 70% of the time. Um, that's generally the industry-wide data. Now, the question is, um, why would RISC-5 be any different? And, you know, why should verifying processors should be any easier in case of RISC-5? Um, and, you know, who's going to verify that these bugs in the processors don't reach the silicon. How much time will it take to verify these? Um, so we've been looking at different cores. Um, you know, we've looked at the Pulp Platform cores. We've looked at some of the other cores. And what we've found is that a lot of the verification baseline work has already been done using dynamic simulation. And what we're finding is when we are grabbing hold of these cores, and we are exercising our isoformal proof kit. Um, we are either finding bugs very quickly or we are actually able to prove when there are no bugs that there aren't any, but both of these artifacts are equally important. Um, so what we're doing here is architectural modeling of the RISC-V instruction set architecture. And what we are trying to do on top of that is to go down deep to figure out if the architectural compliance is met for these processors that we are verifying against the published RISC-5 ISA standard, which we have encoded in our formal proof kit. However, to try and find bugs, this activity alone is not adequate, and we have to go deeper into the realms of functional verification. So if I just want to talk about architectural verification, what we found is that just by plugging in our proof kit into the processors and just orchestrating the properties that we uh, supply with the proof kit, we're able to catch the architectural bugs very, very quickly. And I want to talk about one particular kind of bug that we actually found, um, which is architectural. Um, and, you know, we've published uh, case studies and talks about this the work. It's in the RISC Five Summit last year. We published a white paper summarizing it. Uh, we gave a webinar on this. But today, I just want to focus on one or two representative bugs um, that we found using formal and using architectural and then microarchitectural uh, verification. But before I do that, I just want to briefly describe why we view that microprocessor verification is far from being trivial. Uh, people who do SOC designs may find that the SOC design verification is a very onerous, tedious, complex task. Uh, the guys who are doing the GPUs may feel the same way, and the guys who are building huge networking designs may feel the same way. 
but actually microprocessor verification is not trivial and that's because they are heavily pipelined they have optimization features such as forwarding interlocking they've got branch predictors they've got jumps exceptions stalls interrupts you name it debug all of this actually is causing a lot of potential for bugs to be uh, escaping to the silicon on top of that, a lot of RISC-V vendors are building custom extensions. Uh, low power vendors are actually putting clock gating into it. Arithmetic is, is a very heavy verification task on its own. The use of Xs for low power causes a lot of problem. Um, functional safety is an important aspect if you were gonna ship these processors in the automotive domain. And if you want to be sure that your cores are secure, and are free from Trojan attacks, then you're asking for a lot of work to be done. And the time scales we are talking about are not, are not huge. So the time to market is shrinking, of course. So there is a very nice paper that uh, Miroslav Velev published in ITC in 2003, where he provided a nice summary of a lot of high level microprocessor bugs. And I strongly recommend listeners to go and take a look at that. Now, simulation alone is not adequate in actually um, finding all of the bugs and the corner case bugs and all of these optimizations that I mentioned. So, so conventional verification traditionally relies uh, on simulation. And in fact, uh, prior to dynamic simulation, uh, microprocessor architects were heavily using architectural testing where they were sending specific instruction sequences on the implementation and they were checking whether the result of the execution of a subtract instruction or an add instruction is what is expected. But of course, with the number of interactions happening in the core with respect to pipelining, forwarding, stalling, with interrupts and debug, the crisscross of all of this means that actually trying to dream up all of these complex input sequences for dynamic simulation is not going to be trivial. And I truly believe that people should consider um, applying formal uh, for architecture testing for processors. Um, so what we've done is we build our proof kit once and then you can use this to verify again and again using formal properties. And, um, and that's something that is pretty easy to get on with. But one thing I want to talk about is some of the bugs that we actually caught. So let me describe a particular bug, which is architectural in nature and we basically caught this in like seven cycles. And the fun of this bug is not in the fact that we just caught this so soon, but in fact, how we were able to truly establish that this bug exists and how we also established how this bug could be avoided. Okay, so let me um, describe the bug. So what happens is we were looking at this IBEX score and um, this is a clone of a core called Zero Risky that was built by the Pulp Platform team. IBEX itself has been in design uh, by a company called Low Risk in Cambridge. And when we investigated the score, it was month one uh, since IBEX was uh, under development. But because it was a clone of Zero Risky, we expected all our proof kit properties to actually work out of the box, which in fact they did. And we were able to um, get it up and running within half an hour of ch checking out IBEX. Now, what we noticed was that, yes, okay, there was um, a strong overlap, as I said, between Zero Risky and IBEX. So there was this debug interface in Zero Risky, which was flaky and buggy. And we had found those bugs and established when those bugs were real bugs. So when we grabbed hold of uh, IBEX, we tied off the incoming debug. And this is the fun where I uh, talk about constraints in formal now. So we just constrained the debug input pin to be low and debug was inactive. And I did the same for IBEX. And what I found was immediately out of the box, as I said, within half an hour, uh, architectural checks on IBEX were just coming out to be exhaustively true, valid. Absolutely great fun establishing that your core is working correctly. I then thought to myself, okay, because this also has a debug input pin, let me try and make this active and see what happens. Now, what I found was something quite interesting. So this core has a FSM, controller FSM, and it has like you would expect many different states. So it has a reset state, then it goes into boot set, 
first fetch, then into decode. What I found was that if a debug request was activated on the input when the controller FSM was in decode state, then none of the instructions in the ISA could be executed correctly by the IBEX implementation. So this is quite interesting. Okay, it took us seven clock cycles to um, find this failure. Uh, it took us a matter of seconds. What I got intrigued was, okay, what happens if I now go back to what Zero Risky was and tie off the debug? And yes, it, of, of course, these bugs disappear and the properties now execute as if they were working correctly on a, as you would expect on a, on a core. But then I got interested in understanding the interplay of the arrival of debug. So rather than just masking it off or just turning it on completely on the two extremes, I thought it may be interesting to try to actually control the activation of incoming debug through a formal constraint to see if I can control when the debug arrives. So I coded a very simple constraint in formal to say that if debug did arrive, it can arrive in any other state but the decode state of the controller FSM. So very, very simple constraint. And as soon as I wrote this, I found that the properties would still prove exhaustively. This was, this was quite an eye-opener because I wasn't expecting debug to kind of half work. I thought it's either works or it doesn't. But now here I had an example of the fact that debug was actually working, was kind of broken, but not broken to the extent that it could impact uh, the, the execution of the core regardless of when the debug arrived. So, so then I said, okay, if that is the case, then this suggests to me that if the incoming debug was to arrive in decode, would this break the property? And in fact, I already had the waveform suggesting it would. So we were basically able to pinpoint the fact that there was a bug in the core, that it couldn't handle the debug properly, the fact that actually if I disable the debug, I could prove that all instructions would work correctly. Number three, that the precise arrival of debug would actually have an impact on the correctness of the core. And we were able to nail down which states in, the, in which FSM of the IBEX core would actually be impacted. And therefore, we could also establish that if the arrival of the debug was masked, and was not allowed to come when it caused the problem, it would actually not have the problem in the execution of the core. So being able to do this in formal with such a speed and be able to come up with an assessment of where the problem really exists in the design at an architectural level in a microprocessor is a fascinating experience, which I would thought would, would be nice to share with you guys. So. I think I've already taken a lot of time. Uh, I was hoping I would be able to give you a summary without uh, taking this much time, but I hope you enjoyed this um, story that I told about architectural verification uh, using formal uh, of processors and using constraints to actually isolate the root cause of the bug. So uh, I hope you continue to stay in touch. Please subscribe um, to our YouTube channel and uh, stay st safe, uh, stay connected and stay home. And we will be back next week. Thank you very much.